Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. The webinars that we are delivering at the, um, for you are part of Surrey Wildlife Trust Wilder Communities programme. And this programme is all about helping people to make their neighbourhoods a little wilder and a little richer in nature. Um, so without delay, um, I would like to introduce you to our first speaker. Um, we have the wonderful Louis Harrington Edmonds from Bug Life, um, who is working working in partnership with us at Surrey Wildlife Trust. So I'm going to ask um, Louis if he would like to turn here. Oh, he's already there. Look at that. <laughs> slick, slick, brilliant. Louis, nice to see you. Um, so we're going to spotlight onto you and I will turn myself quiet. Over to you, Louis. Hello. Um, hopefully you can all hear me. And you can see my screen. Uh, um, so it's lovely to be with you today. Uh, I'm a conservation officer with Bug Life and today I will be talking to you about uh, Surrey's pollinators and some of the bee lines work that I'm doing in the county at the moment. Um, so who are Bug Life? We're the Invertebrate Conservation Trust. We're the only charitable organisation in Europe that is dedicated to the conservation of all invertebrates. Um, to do that, we have uh, an aim of stopping the extinction of invertebrates, but also achieving uh, sustainable populations. Um, to do that, we've got three-pronged approach, uh, which is to make room for invertebrates, then we want to make those areas safe for invertebrates, and we also want to build friendly relationships between people and invertebrates along the way. So, um, just looking at this animation, you can see the importance of invertebrates. So they actually make up 73% of our species globally. Um, and that's dwarfing groups that we often probably think are bigger, such as fungi and plants and algae as well. Um, while it's also important to note that in the UK, um, the majority of our conservation uh, resources are often dedicated towards birds, although these uh, make up less than 0.1% of, of our species in, this, in globally. So in the UK alone, we have over 40,000 UK invertebrates. Um, a lot of my work focuses on the top three or four groups here, uh, which are the major pollinating groups. So that's 7,000 flies, 9,000 bees and wasps, uh, 2,600 butterflies and moths, and also around 4,000 beetles. Um, but it's also worth noting there's major groups that we haven't even got an accurate figure of how many there are yet, like the nematodes and mites. So why should we be helping invertebrates? Well, I'd argue myself that there's an intrinsic value um, and that they have a right to share our spaces um, and that human extinction is wrong. Um, this is also reflected in a lot of uh, spiritual and religious teachings, um, if there's people that have those sorts of beliefs. Um, but also they provide us with a lot of stuff. Um, Non-financial things, they provide us uh, just a few examples, our pleasure and inspiration, they influence our culture significantly, and they also provide us with a connection to nature. But they're also really uh, important providers within our econo economic systems. Um, insect pollination is important for 90% of our crop species. Um, Invertebrates also maintain the soil quality and the soil structure itself for those crop production. And that's valued at 16 billion pounds per year in this country in just the top soil there alone. In terms of um, research as well, they're really important in underpinning medicinal research. So during COVID-19, many of the treatments and vaccinations that were developed to treat that ep epidemic um, relied on invertebrates with horseshoe crabs, medicinal leech, and freshwater mussel, just in a few examples of those as well. We also don't have any idea of what future assets uh, might be derived from invertebrates. So all of this um, evaluation of their value is just a snapshot of now, basically. And just to highlight some of that aesthetic beauty that I touched on, these are some of my photos from around Surrey. So we've got the beautiful iridescent uh, green rose chafer beetle there. Um, our beautiful butterflies like this large skipper and um, some of 
you might have seen our red soldier beetles that appear on are in decline and um, there's a range of uh, drivers behind this that includes things like climate change pesticide and fertilizer use and um, artificial light pollution but by far the biggest driver of invertebrate declines uh, and extinctions to date has been the loss of uh, habitats and subsequent fragmentation of those spaces. We've lost 97% of uh, wildflower rich habitat in this country alone that uh, equates to 3 million hectares and that's occurred just since the 1930s. And the result is what remains for our invertebrates is often a fragmented picture. Um, and that's really demonstrated if we look here at uh, Dorset heaths. Uh, so on the left, you can see between 1811 and 1960, the massive reduction in those spaces, uh, while the gaps in between those that species have to come overcome to move uh, have grown massively in size. And on the right, it's just sort of uh, telling us that it's the usual suspects that have driven that. It's urban encroachment. Uh, intensification and mechanic mechanization of our agriculture and also planting of large areas with monocultures for things like the timber industry as well. Unfortunately, the result of that has been extinctions. Um, in the UK, we've seen 1,260 invertebrate extinctions in the last 100 years, and some of these constitute global extinctions as well. Um, and this is probably an underestimation with 250 UK beetles alone um, not been seen since the 1970s. And if we really bring that to a local level in Surrey, we've seen a 12% extinction rate in our invertebrates, according to the last State of Nature report. Um, and that occurred in the 40 years prior to that report. And if we don't do anything, um, unfortunately, it's a picture that's likely to get worse. Um, this is a study by the University of York. Um, uh, the graphs showing different assessed groups of invertebrates. And between the dotted and uh, the so between the solid to the dotted line, we can see how much our climate is changing in terms of moving northwards in kilometers per year. And it's about 12 kilometer per year sh shift northwards. While the yellow bar shows how much the invertebrates have moved in response to that, averaging about two kilometers per year. Um, and what we can see by that is that our invertebrates are unable to respond to a moving climate due to that loss of habitat and habitat fragmentation across a range of taxa. And that means that our remaining invertebrate populations are unfortunately uh, sort of marooned on islands with increasingly unsuitable climate conditions for them. So it's not all doom and gloom. So what's the solution? This is bug life solution, which is called Bee Lines. It's the world's largest and most joined up habitat connectivity project. Uh, it consists of three kilometer wide continuous lines that link the best remaining wildlife areas. Um, and our goal is to fill these uh, bee lines with permanent wildflower rich habitat. And this provides a coordinated and collaborative approach to delivering habitat connectivity. And our models suggest by targeting our habitat delivery within these bee lines, we can achieve UK wide habitat connectivity for invertebrates with five times less resources and delivery on the ground. So how did we come up with these? Um, so we started by mapping the best remaining habitats in areas above two hectares. And then secondarily um, beneficial habitats as well. We then took the operation on the ground and help us draw the best lines uh, connecting those sites and then subsequently voting on them to determine which uh, B lines were best. And if we look to our own county, we can see it actually does a really good job of joining the county. So it reaches almost every local authority. And then if we see with the Surrey Wildlife Trust sites overlap, we can see the sort of habitats we're talking about there. So in the north and west of the county, we're talking about our lowland heaths, in particular the big military training areas, as well as places like Chobham Common. Um, while in the centre and the east of the county, it's looking at a lot of the chalk downland that remains um, in the Surrey Hills AONB. And so what are our sort of guiding principles for that? So as I mentioned, we want to deliver wildflower rich habitat as that supports the most invertebrate species. In this county, that often looks like, uh, like chalk grassland and lowland heath, but not exclusively. 
And we're delivering this through creation of new habitats, restoration of existing habitats or enhancement of existing habitats. Um, and this can be done either for expanding existing sites along the bee lines or creating stepping stones between them. Um, we aim to make habitat patches larger than two hectares, otherwise we see a big drop off of species in areas below that, while uh, the gaps we try and minimise to 0.3 kilometre gaps, ideally in line with the foraging distances of most of our solitary bees. Um, we also opt for an agrochemical free approach and ask for a 10 year management commitment from land managers. And lastly, just to give you an idea of what that looks like on the ground, these are a range of activities that Beeline's work is looking at. So in the top left, you can see encroaching scrub on chalk grasslands. So uh, we can pay for contractors or help uh, land managers to remove that, or you as individuals can volunteer with the trust as they do a lot of scrub clearance across their estate. Um, in the top centre, just letting nature take charge a bit more and sympathetic uh, mowing regimes. In the top right, something more drastic, that's the creation of new wildflower meadows through um, scarification of the soil and adding of wildflower seed mixes, similar to the bottom left, which is using uh, green hay. And at the bottom there, you, uh, as individuals, you can do wildlife gardening or create bee hotels in your own spaces. And lastly, just in the bottom right, we have an interactive map. So please do, if you're doing anything for pollinators, let us know about it so that we can contact if we want to support or just see where the people are doing stuff to support Beeline's work. Thank you for listening. That's been a really whistle-stop tour of um, my work. And I'll drop some stuff in the chat if you want to find out more or feel free to email me as we'll have workshops coming up about delivering Beeline's work in more detail. Thank you. Oh, that was fantastic, Louis. Um, like you say, uh, quite a, a brief um, um, snapshot of all the wonderful things you're doing, but really great to see all those positive actions for, for nature that you were talking about to try and encourage all of our pollinators um, to be able to do their job. So fabulous. Thank you, Louis. And if you do have any questions for Louis, please remember to pop them in the, the Q&A section. And then when we, we've listened to all of our um, speakers this afternoon, we'll be able to answer some of those questions. So brilliant, thank you. So moving swiftly on, we I would like to introduce you to Lucy Bryce, who um, is our Nature-Based Solutions, Solutions Manager. <laughs> from, I don't put my teeth in, sorry, Lucy, um, from Surrey Wildlife Trust. Um, and she's going, she's going to kick off with one of our first Nature-Based Solutions talks. So over to you, Lucy. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, bit of a delay. There we go. Can everyone see that? Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you, Lucy. Lovely. So, um, thank you, Emma. As Emma says, I'm going to give you a quick whistle stop tour around nature based solutions. I'll be focusing mainly on the kind of land based stuff, and then Glenn will follow up with some talks about water. I think I will say that this is very much an introduction. Nature-based solutions is a huge topic, and it's a topic not just being explored here in the UK, but also globally. So we are at the very beginning of this journey. And so bear with us, the science is still developing. So I know that some of you will have seen the first set of webinars, and Sarah Jane sort of talked briefly about some of the impacts and issues which we're facing. I think it's important I'm just going to readdress some of those quickly before I start my talk. So obviously we've got the massive issue with biodiversity loss and that's something very close to the hearts of all of us at the Wildlife Trust and indeed for you in the, within the community. But not only biodiversity loss, but a loss of bioabundance. So we're getting isolated populations. As Louis was saying, all these small populations get stuck on smaller sites. They can't move around from place to place and that in turn has a massive impact on biodiversity. Of course, we've got issues with climate as well. Our, our winters, as demonstrated by the last couple of weeks, are getting wetter, they're getting warmer. And our summers, conversely, are actually getting far hotter. 40 degrees in the UK is not normal, and that will become more normal unless we do something quick about it. And also we had massive impact with things like wildfires, which of course probite ranges had a, had a problem with this year. And these have economic impacts as well. We're having to deal with all of these um, through our insurance 
and globally, there's massive impacts on food supplies and our food security is being affected. And of course, there is the health and well-being crisis as well, as highlighted by the pandemic. We rely massively on our local nature reserves for places of refuge during the pandemic. And our connection with nature was strengthened and we really want to hold on to that and see if we can increase it. So what are nature-based solutions? Well, this is what could only be described as quite a long-winded description. I'm gonna break it down a little bit more. Nature-based solutions really is nature giving us some of the tools that we need to help resolve some of the issues that we have really created. So this could be around flooding, it could be around helping to reduce pollution levels, it could be around soil erosion. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about each of those in just a moment. So how might this affect you within your communities? Well, you are likely to have one of these habitats on your site or nearby your, or near your home or in your community space. So first of all, we've got hedgerows, We've got grasslands in all the different ways that they come, whether it be chalk grassland, whether you might have pasture, hay, meadow. Woodlands, of course, we all have plenty of woodland here in Surrey, it's the most wooded county. And not forgetting scrub as well. Really important habitat that often gets overlooked. Have a little think about your site as I go through the next slide. Where are your hedgerows situated? Are they at the top or bottom of your site? Is your site on a slope? Is it in a dip? Are your grasslands healthy? Do they supply good populations of invertebrates? Are they on a slope? Do you have areas of bare ground? Do you have problems with erosion? Are your woodlands managed? Do they create a buffer to another area of your site? And is scrub patchy? Is it at the top or bottom of your site? Do you have any rivers or ponds? Are you, are you located next to a farm? Are you located next to a road? Just think about those things as I go through this next slide. I've lost me arrows, here we go. Okay, so I've picked this rather sad looking <laughs> um, tree to sort of give a demonstration, but you can imagine that this might be a group of trees, it might be a hedgerow, it might be an area of scrub, and also not forgetting our grassland as well, which sits underneath. So how does nature-based solutions work for us and how do all these different habitat types support nature-based solutions? Well, the big story at the moment, of course, is locking away carbon. And we're being encouraged, not just here within Surrey, but also worldwide to plant trees. And that's fine, but here in Surrey, as you know, we have quite a lot of trees already. So it's also worth considering things like hedgerows, as they also store huge amounts of carbon, as do our scrub areas. And our grasslands also can help store carbon. A healthy grassland locks carbon away in the soil. It's also worth considering that one tree locks away about 22 kilograms of carbon a year. So that's a mature tree. The average person in the UK uses around 10 tonnes of carbon a year. So we're going to have to get very, very busy planting trees if we want to prevent a buildup of carbon. So we also need to think on a wider scale as well. And I'm sure Glenn will touch on that a little bit with his wetlands talk. And also we need to make changes to our lifestyle. And a great example of that is the discussions going on at COP27 this week. Also having a little think about the filtration of particulates and pollutants. Hedgerows are particular ninjas at this. They are fabulous. Recent research put a hedgerow next to a road, between a road and um, a reserve. And the hedgerow was capturing the particulates from, particulates from the road. So the, the particulate pollutants coming through was remaining within the hedge and the volumes on the roadside compared to the site side were greatly reduced. So they are fantastic at, at capturing pollutants. But it's also worth bearing in mind that pollutants don't just go in our air, they are also traveling through our soils. And root systems of all of these things are fantastic at capturing pollutants as they come through. And this is given examples where we plant buffers along rivers or um, have lo longer grass next to riverbanks, or maybe um, put a buffer zone of trees or hedgerows. And this will help to um, protect your site against some of these pollutants coming in. The other thing to think about is um, soil erosion. And um, soil erosion is a massive problem all over the county and all over the UK particularly around farms. So if you are um, next to a farm or if you're on a steep slope, then it might be worth considering a little bit about how you can use planting of trees or scrub or hedgerows 
to help slow that soil erosion. And of course, grasslands are fantastic. A well-managed grassland with lots of nice um, sward will help to cling on to that soil, preventing it from running downhill. And that in turn will pr protect our rivers and um, our ditch lines from becoming overly polluted. They're also great at protecting things from wind. So we don't really think about this very often, but soil erosion can also happen when our conditions are very, very dry in the summer. Wind can take off the top soil. And so having a good covering over your soil um, will help to prevent that from happening. It is worth noting though, that we do like some bare ground, don't we? So um, obviously for our vertebrate populations, it is good to have bare ground patches, but it's just worth keeping in mind that you want to hold on to some of your soils as well. Soil temperature is a really interesting one. So obviously most of these features have canopies. Uh, tree canopies obviously being the largest and then scrub and then of course um, hedgerows. And these canopies obviously provide shade. So they're fantastic for us in that we can obviously find refuge during the summer, but also for a wide variety of wildlife too. And for our soil, obviously a tree canopy within a woodland will create a much cooler soil underneath. And this is particularly good if you have a site within a city it's worth thinking about the fact that you can create a cool environment by doing some tree planting. But remember, right tree, right place. Don't plant if you've got a beautiful chalk grass and you don't want a woodland popping up in the middle. So if you need any advice on that, then please feel free to get in touch with us. Soil health is a massive topic as well at the moment and increasingly important, not just for our farmers, but also for our reserves. We have a much increased um, uh, heightened risk of pollution from roads and also from aircraft traffic. And so it's really worth thinking about how you can preserve your soil health within your site. Well, actually, do you know what? Tree roots are fantastic or hedgerow roots, whatever roots you might have, are really good for helping with this. They create better aeration through the soil. They help with water absorption. And they also um, provide also great little um, niches for habitat and for fungi. So we're all the time thinking about how we can create um, microbacteria within the soil to help boost soil health. And farmers are really beginning to focus heavily on this. Health and well-being is obviously a massive part of what, what um, we're all here for. And we enjoy being outside and we want to share that with people and create environments that people wish to use. And so, you know, think about sitting under a tree and how wonderful that can be about the, the benefits of taking a walk through a woodland, of sitting amongst bees, butterflies and buzzing bugs in the summer. All the work that we're doing will also help to boost the well-being of the people in our communities. And also think about how your habitat is from top to bottom. So for instance, a hedgerow is one of fantastic ways of creating a habitat, not just high to low, but side to side as well. It creates a real highway for a wide range of species. So there's a massive benefit to going all the way through, whether it be birds, bees, butterflies, through your, your meadow layer and down into your soils. Some of you will be looking at community space in, spaces in urban environments and actually uh, Nature-based solutions are massively active in urban environments. So whether it's preventing flooding, which I know that um, Glenn will be coming on to a little bit, but also about the kind of infrastructure which is already there. So think about whether your site is next to a rail railway, for example. These are fantastic network connections for a whole range of sites. They're running all through our landscape, a little bit like the bug lines do. And it's really worth thinking about how your site might connect up with others. Also, if you've got hard infrastructure, so roofs or walls, how can you make those more nature friendly? So green roofs and bus stops, for example, has become a really popular option. Green walls or just planting around hard spaces. And also think about urban environments as a whole. How can you make them more nature friendly? How can you connect your garden or community space to a neighbouring one? How can you increase pollinators? But also how can you help stop the flow of pollution and of course hedgerows, scrub, grasslands and woodlands all play their part. If you need any further help then please feel free to get in touch with us but I hope that's given you a very quick whirlwind example of some of the nature-based solutions which are available. Thank you for listening.
Fascinating, Lucy. Um, I'm sure we could extend that conversation and you could tell us lots of lots of other wonderful um, top tips as well. That was really, really interesting. Um, thank you very much. And lots of um, really positive ideas for all our for our audience. So thank you very much for that. Um, so, OK, so that our next presentation, we are going to move on to Glenn, who is also part of the Nature Based Solutions team. Um, do remember, please, before I pass over to Glenn that if you do have any questions remember to put them in the Q&A um, section down at the bottom and we'll address them all at the end um, but without any further ado um, Glenn is our wetlands project manager um, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about um, what he does over to you Glenn. Excellent thank you very much Emma and uh, yeah welcome everyone uh, thank you for coming along today uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Glenn Skelton. I'm the Wetland Projects Manager at Surrey Wildlife Trust. Um, I spent probably the last nine years getting in and out of rivers, doing a lot of small scale restoration. Um, these days, though, we're looking much wider landscape scale type schemes, thinking about um, nature based solutions, as uh, Lucy was talking about. Uh, we really looking at ways we can actually work with both people and wildlife to actually create resilient catchments. So that's what we're going to be talking about a little bit today. Um, I just want to start by um, doing a shout out to the Unstead uh, Nature Reserve group who are on here. I've noticed a few of you in the chat today. Um, the group have uh, been managing a Thames water site down near Godalming. Um, and to be honest, uh, with limited resources, they've done absolutely amazing work on this wetland site. Um, so I Absolutely. would encourage anyone who is interested in, you know, uh, restoring a wetland site or creating a wetland site to really go down to that site and have a look. Glenn, so, can I just interrupt you for a second and say, can you put your script, your share, your um, slideshow on your presentation mode? Because we're still on can, the. Yeah. Do Thank apologize. you. That's OK. Thanks. There's, always, there's always one. Well, you know, there had to be. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so as you as you've seen this year, we're going through a bit of a famine or feast cycle with rain. Um, really tough year for our rivers and our ponds as well. We've seen a lot of our headwater streams drying up. We're seeing populations of our uh, brown trout, you know, populations that have been there for thousands of years in some cases, starting to get into trouble. Um, ponds drying up, really affecting the biodiversity in those. And then at the other end of the scale, of course, um, we're flooding all the time as well. And floods are increasing in frequency. Uh, they're becoming a lot more severe. And it's really the way we manage our catchments um, that, is, that is leading to this, or the way we have managed our catchments in the past. So I want you to think about... Um, you know, a, a catchment like a sponge. So when it rains, what we what we want our catchments to be doing is to actually absorbing all of that rainwater like a sponge. So it doesn't all just get into the river straight away and come down and flood our towns, but it's released slowly throughout um, the dry periods as well. And this is really important because it actually helps to drip feed our rivers during those dry periods. So keeping those flows going. Of course, our wetlands as well. You know, if we can keep watering our soils, watering our woodlands and in our wetlands as well, this all helps towards that. So it's it's really important that we start thinking about how we're going to be adapting to the new normal, which is these extreme weather events. So as Lucy mentioned, nature based solutions is the way we do this and all of our wetlands sort of program and planning is now based on nature based solutions. Nature based solutions offer. Um, ways for us to mitigate flooding, they help us to store carbon, they keep nutrients out of our water courses, etc. But they're also fantastic for biodiversity. So what I'm going to do in this short presentation is just go through a few of those solutions uh, into, uh, from a wetlands perspective and how, you know, how they can actually help us to um, increase biodiversity. I'd just like to start by saying one of the key things on your sites that you either manage or that you volunteer on, it's really good to get them mapped. Map which water, where your water courses are, where your wetland areas are. Is there any depressions on the site that hold water throughout the year? You know, is there, is there areas that just remain boggy, etc.? Have you got streams? Have you got ditch lines, ponds? Get it all mapped down if you can. And then you can start to plan. You can start to think about how can we re-wet some areas? 
how can we reduce flooding in these areas or hold back water, etc. It's it's really useful for planning ahead. And it also helps to link in with other schemes. There might be wider schemes in the area um, where they're thinking about natural flood management. And you could you could potentially become part of those schemes. And there's often money available to actually deliver some of the capital works associated with that. So looking at some of the solutions. So um, grassland management. If you think about all of the grass and we've got um, across the across the county, all of those soils, this is a huge reservoir for holding water. But unfortunately, our soils aren't in a particularly good state. When we have a monoculture grassland, um, you'll often have very shallow rooted plants and they don't really get down into the soil profile. When you have a mixed sward, so lots of different flowers growing, you know, a herb rich layer, They'll all have different depths, rooting depths. And the deeper those roots go down, of course, it helps to break up the soil. Water gets down there and it also, you know, it, it helps water to stay in the soil. All of that groundwater is really important, again, for keeping our rivers flowing, but also really important for soil biota as well. Also excellent at store, storing carbon as well. Those roots will be taking carbon down. That will be sort of leaking out of those roots, so to speak, and helping to build carbon in the soil. And carbon in a lot of our agricultural soils, for example, is, is, is not doing very well. So thinking about how you can manage grasslands on your sites is not just good for storing carbon, storing water. It's also fantastic for things like pollinators as well, which, um, which you know, will be making use of all of those flowers. Buffer strips along, uh, along water courses. Now, if you think about all of the rivers, streams, ditches, it's an absolute wildlife super highway. So if we can create a bit of a corridor, that, that can link up so many different areas. So we always like buffer strips to be at least six metres wide. Uh, they, can, they can be uh, tall herbs, they can be trees even. Um, but certainly in a farmed environment, they're fantastic, as Lucy mentioned, for um, slowing down overland flow, helping sediment to drop out of suspension of that water. So by the time the water does flow over into the river, it's been cleaned a lot. And that soil has actually stayed on the field side rather than getting into the river and damaging the biodiversity in the river. So buffer strips, fantastic wildlife corridor and great for actually cleaning up our rivers as well. Ditch management. So um, many of you will have ditch lines on your reserve, and um, these are these are where there's a really good opportunity for holding water back. You can use it to, you know, for natural flood management to help uh, reduce local flooding, but also really good for re-wetting areas. So if there's, you know, if you wanted some wetter grassland, you can block up ditches or put these leaky barriers in, which will hold water back. And you can do an awful lot with ditches. You can scallop the edges, create low shelves where you get a lot of marginal plants growing up. Great areas for habitat with that still water as well. Sorry, great areas for amphibians where you um, where you have the still water sitting in, in the ditches as well. And it can be used to, you know, just create um, a much sort of wetter area, which is is helping to keep rivers flowing during those dry periods as well. Flood storage ponds, um, again, this is another natural flood management technique and the pond you can see in the picture here, this is um, uh, one that we put in on the Rye Brook in near Leather, sorry, near Ashstead. Uh, this went in in 2019. And basically this pond works when the river is high, it actually ends up running part, there's a, a pipe which goes out of the riverbank and feeds this pond. So this pond will fill up during high flows. Now the the pond has an outlet, so it will flow in. But what that's doing, it's helping to store water and it's taking that water out of the system. So it's reducing the amount of water heading off down towards Leatherhead. So it's a, again, it's a good natural flood management technique. It's not going to do an awful lot on its own. But if you had a network of ponds like this, they all start to start to help to reduce flooding. But on top of that, it's a fantastic habitat. And this is a, the really dry summer we've had this year and you can still see there's a puddle in the back end of that pond that stayed wet this was absolutely full of um, frog spawn earlier this year you can see the uh, the bulrushes of um, colonized great for invertebrates as well dragonflies damselflies things that love living in wet mud as well so flood storage ponds they do 
when they're of this sort of size, they do need uh, planning permission in some author local authorities. Um, but there are ways to do it on um, a bit easier than this without having to go down, you know, such complicated routes. But it just depends where your reserve is. Hedgerows and shelter belts. So Lucy talked about um, this as well. And hedgerows, if you're if you're managing a reserve that's on a slope, hedgerows are great at uh, reducing overland flow. They could. This is what we'd call a kested hedgerow. And you're probably thinking there's not actually a hedgerow there. I think it's waiting to be planted. But a kested hedgerow is built on a bank, and it basically acts a, as a bund, and it stores that water, allows it to infiltrate, stops it flowing down the hill or onto the nearest road, causing localized flooding. And again, this can be done with trees in like a shelter belt format as well, which helps to break up the soil. So as the water runs down the slope, it will actually manage to infiltrate as it hits those trees. Fantastic wildlife corridor as well. So shelter belts, hedgerows, they link up our countryside, allow biodiversity to move through, but they can also be a fantastic solution for flooding as well. And that's me, a uh, bit of a whistle stop tour, but yeah, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Glenn. Wow, um, I, I think I'm gonna take on that term, the wildlife super highway. We talk <laughs> about these connecting um, corridors, green corridors with our, the students that we're working with, but the wildlife super highway is definitely one we're gonna take on board. So thank you, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, lots of really great ideas, lots of um, salute nature-based solutions there. So thank you very much, Glenn. Um, so, we are before we going on to our final speaker this afternoon um, we have a little poll for you because we want to sort of get a bit of an idea of some of the things that you might like some further in, um, talks from us so we are going to host a little poll um, that should be coming up onto your screens let's just see if that pops in now hopefully that will pop on up let me See if, oh, oh, as if by magic, there it is. Um, so if we have a little look on here, these are our little, um, some options for some learning options that we would like to get your ideas back on. Um, if there's anything that you would like to tick on there that you would like a few more presentations about, then let us know. So we will give you a, a minute or two to um, be able to select your choice. Um, how many things you would like to learn a little bit more about, whether it's pollinators, nature-based solutions, rivers and streams, flood mitigation, protected species, protected habitats, or none of the above. And there'd be maybe perhaps if there's other things that you're interested in, let us know in the chat. So I'll leave that just open for another few moments. And once you give you all a little bit of time to vote, um, and then we'll see what our results are. Let's see, here we go. Oh, gosh, I think we'll be doing lots of presentations by the looks of it. So coming up um, for the top vote this afternoon, seems to be looking at how we can increase that habitat value for pollinators with a 79%. Um, so yes, but... Yes, with nature-based solutions coming in very close behind at 65%, protected habitats coming in at 53%, rivers and streams and floods and protected species all coming in there. Um, so yes, thank you very much indeed for your responses to that. That would be marvellous. Um, so we will go on to our final speaker of the afternoon. We have Rob Hutchinson's, who is the manager for Ecology Planning Advice Services. Is that correct, Rob? Have I got your title right? That's it, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Um, and he's going to do, be our last presentation and talk to us. So I shall pass over to you, Rob, um, and we'll make sure that your screen and everything. Oh, straight in. Look at that. Amazing. Can you see that, Emma? Is that okay? Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you very much indeed. And noted that um, protected habitats are the most popular source of information people would like to know more about. Um, thank you for getting, had the opportunity for, to speak to you all. It's, um, it's a lovely opportunity to speak to your different groups. And I'd just like to start by saying what an important role you all play in conservation of Surrey and, and species work that goes into the conservation in Surrey, so thank you for all your hard work. And um, 
initially the first thing to, to thing to set out is just to set out sort of objectives of this talk and just um, provide some kind of learning objective in, in, in the 10 minutes that I have. I think the most important thing I can do in this 10 minutes is to introduce to you the protected species and habitats in a Surrey context and try and explain what that means. Um, try and increase some awareness of, of habitats and species in the Surrey context, also hopefully just to intrigue a little bit and, um, and hopefully be inspired some, some further learning and materials to look into. But uh, the first two speakers were all fantastic and they all had various aspects of, of serious notes and obviously climate change and things like that. I will start off by good news and positive messaging by saying Surrey is a fantastic county for wildlife and habitats. I think it's really important that we, we do recognise that this is a biodiverse county and we should be really proud of, of the county and the th different habitats that exist in the species. There aren't many counties that have six species of, of reptile, the amount of amphibians, at least 14 species of bats, lots of different types of birds, different botanical interests, ancient woodlands, ancient hedgerows, heathland habitats, rare chalk grasslands, acidic grasslands, the list, the list goes on. So must, must remember that there is a fantastic amount of biodiversity. Now, the first thing, the adder in the bottom corner is, is one of my favourite protected species, but um, five points if you can guess if it's a female or a male, and 10 more points if you can guess why or know why. Put it in the chat and see, see what comes up. Um, when you see a habitat, I think I'll give you show two types of habitat here. There's obviously one wooden habitat and more of a wooden ed ha edge habitat near it, near a river. And I think when looking at these photos, I'll give you 20, 20 to 30 seconds in the time we have. What protected species do you see in these habitats? And I'll just talk talk while you think and just. Habitats on photos like these show you the habitat, but there is so much underneath the, these photos that that may be present or are present. And it's important to, I think, understand that there's a lot of potential for protected species to be present in very good habitat, but also in edge habitat. So with no prior knowledge or some prior knowledge, there are a range of species that could use these habitats. And by the end, hopefully we can know a bit more about what could exist in these habitats. So on the one hand, we have a woodland and a wooden edge. To define the, the umbrella of a protected species is, is a very big umbrella. And what does it actually mean? So you'll hear, you'll hear quite often people saying, what is a protected species? And and to be honest, a protected species is a species that has a level of legislation protection or planning policy protection. There is a fair amount of planning policy or legislation for, for species and habitats. I've included here some of the, the ones you may have heard of or some of the really big hitters. There, there are more, but I think we need to focus maybe on, on the bigger ones. A protected species, the biggest level of protected species at the moment you can have is to be a European protected species as a banner. This includes things like bats, great crested newt, hazel dormouse, smooth snake, sand lizard. And this gives them a level of protection from killing and injury, but also the habitat and resting places when they're present gets a level of protection, which is important, important in their conservation. You, the biggest potentially domestic legislation we have is, is the Wildlife and Countryside Act, which is 1990, 1981 as amended. This protects almost every species group from deliberate killing and injury. It protects bird, nesting birds and things like that. You'll often hear, hear that mentioned for birds. Badgers have their own act, the Protection of Badgers Act, which is mainly was brought in in terms of um, stopping cruelty to badgers. It doesn't make them a European protected species, but it gives them a protection in their set and um, is very, very important legislation. The UK Mammals Act protects all, all native species of mammal and avoids them being uh, treated cruel in a cruel way. 
a slightly different protected species is is on the natural environment and rural communities act and this is often slanged as being what's called a priority species now this is something like a hedgehog or a common toad and this is a protected species to some extent it's mainly only protected because it's got planning policy protection so what that means is uh, things like common toad and hedgehog at the moment they are required they, they are highlighted on this legislation as being a species in decline or under threat. Therefore, planning applications and planning policy decisions have to have regard for this animal and not cause further declines. So it's, these, are, these are the main banner acts. You, you may have heard them flounted around in, in planning applications or other things, but they are varied and ranging. And generally, plants are also included on this as well. But what you can and can't do by law varies from species to species, species to species. If you have particular interest species, then we can discuss them after with more specifics, but um, that's a whistle stop tour of, of those. Quite a large amount of information to digest here. And um, the main purpose is to, is to highlight a range of different habitats that exist in Surrey and then demonstrate and show what protected species types can exist in them in a general way. This, there are absolute speciality species in this list, but there are definitely trends. So what I would generally say about this is species potential groups, we have bats, birds, badgers, dormice, invertebrates, aquatic and terrestrial, we have amphibians, reptiles, plants and trees, we have aquatic mammals such as beaver, otter, water vole, and it's quite exciting now we have to consider beaver, even, even in a Surrey context, but that's a, a really good step. Now, looking at this list, you can see some real top hitting habitats, things like hedgerows, things like woodland, and things like parkland and meadows, if you've ever been to some, some of those habitats, they can support a very, very high level of protected species. I would say in a Surrey context, ancient woodlands, ancient wooden edge linked with hedgerows are always going to have value for protected species. Because as we mentioned in other talks, the living landscape and connectivity, these super highways are what protected species need to survive. In terms of habitats, similar to protected species in terms of how habitats are protected they have a range of different levels of protection ancient woodland is very protected for very good reasons hedgerows have got two levels of protection you can be an important hedgerow which has its own hedgerow regulations you can be a habitat of principal importance which is a the same as a priority species but as a habitat you can have a range of different protected habitats and generally think they all come under an umbrella of, of priority habitat. This again means that in planning decisions and in policy decisions, there must be regard for these habitats in terms of, of, of even in terms of management, you, it's important to understand what priority habitats are present. Some very, very rare species of habitat will go into forming triple SIs, SACs, which is, uh, are statutory protected sites. Um, so they were, that's a site of special scientific interest and, and um, very protected sites. In terms of Surrey, we're famous for our heathland, we're famous for our woodlands, and we've got some wonderful rivers, as, as Glenn was mentioning, in terms of, and, yeah, I think, Orchards have got a very big place to play as well in, in community groups and any, any real habitat. Um, so what to do, where to do and how to do it. Glenn mentioned a very important point in terms of start to plan, which is planning is so important with, with any conservation project or any proposed management to have to understand what, what you want to do. This is such a whistle stop tour that I would advise if you're going to, you think you may have protected species or habitats, and you might be influencing them even by accident to get some ecological expertise on board or just get that advice. Um, there's CIEM is, is our official chartered uh, body, 
and there is a there is a way of finding ecologists in your area which is on this link i can share if if required later it's always best to to, to be curious and get surveys done if you think there's a, the potential for them to be present because there is legislation for these animals and it's important that they are they are they are considered um in terms of further questions please do get specific on these and ask me any questions you'd like or the rest of the speakers as well and we all if there's more questions afterwards, I'm happy to sort of email and discuss uh, if required. So now we go back to the original photos, and I hope you can see potential for a range of species from reptiles to badger to, um, to amphibians in terrestrial phase, to bats, to birds, to dormice. There's a lot that could live here, which aren't shown by the photos, which just shows the importance of, of planning. And the last thing to say is, so that is an adder. I haven't looked in the comments box, but I will just check before I say the answer, but let's leave it there. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, yes, we did have, um, oh, hang on, I've just clicked on something. We did have, um, somebody did make a comment. Gillian made a comment saying about the adder saying that she thought potentially it was male because it had strong markings. Is she right? Is she going to get the 10 bonus points? She can, she can have 10 bonus points. Woohoo, brilliant, excellent. Um, and I know and Katie Weave had put in as well, and you, you'd asked the question about um, the different animals that might be in those different habitats mm. that she'd put in, dormice, badgers, bats. So I think, yeah, she was definitely on the right lines, wasn't she? Fantastic, yeah. Yeah, excellent. Um, yeah, that was that was really interesting to um, to hear about those different protected habitats. And it's really nice, actually. Thank you, Rob, for reminding us just how fabulous Surrey actually is for wildlife. Um, and it just for me that just sort of reiterates just how important all of these different um, speakers have have said this evening, this afternoon, about the nature-based solutions, about um, bees, bugs and butterflies with the bug life, just how important they all are so that we can maintain um, and protect those habitats that we already have here. So thank you very much, brilliant speakers. And as if by magic, look, you've all come on, on the screen here. Um, so we um, will, we definitely got some questions coming in the Q&A section. So I will read some of those out and then perhaps team, you can, um, I can direct them and you can decide which which one of you inspirational speakers would like to answer it so let's have a look so we have our first question came in from Keith Lightfoot um, and I think because it's a wetland buffer one I think Glenn this is highly likely I think is going to come over to you so Keith's question is is there funding available for planting wetland buffer zones like reed beds or is funding restricted to hedgerows and trees yeah it's a really good um, it's a really good question, actually. I think at the, at the moment we're still in flux, certainly on the funding front. Um, going forward, the environmental land management schemes that will hopefully be uh, coming live uh, for farmers will certainly be paying for buffer strips that will be in there. Uh, but obviously for uh, reserves, uh, it's a bit of a different story. Um, with something like that that may fall under uh, carbon credits or carbon payments because obviously wetlands are an incredible uh, carbon sink um, and if you were looking at things like you know a reed bed for example uh, that would likely fall under that however there's still a lot of science missing on just how much carbon wetlands can store so it's quite difficult to quantify at this point so um all I can say is if anything else does come up regarding that, I will be sure to uh, update you on that, Keith. But um, I don't know if any of the other panellists have any uh, views on that at the moment. I was just going to say, obviously, um, it, it would depend slightly on um, if the wetland is providing, if the wetland buffer zones are providing additional services. So natural flood management is a, is a massive thing going on through the UK, which is looking at how we can better manage our waters to prevent flooding or to slow water or store water. Now, if your um, reed bed was helping to do one of those things, it's potential for it to link into some of that funding, um, but it might need to have an impact, not just where you are, but it would have to show impact further downstream. So it's worth having a, a little think about that, but I'm sure if um, 
you want some extra help with it, then please feel free to get in touch with the team. We might be able to offer some further advice. Great. Thank you both. Very, very useful. Um, so um, a question uh, back straight to you, Lucy, please. I have a question for you from Elspeth um, saying, how can we make house rooftops more wildlife friendly? Really good question. I think I'll be really, really annoying and bat it back slightly in that it will depend largely on your rooftops. Um, a lot of uh, green roofs are obviously one of the first things which I would, I would say back back to you it will depend if your roof is on a slope it depends how old your roof is um and so you'll need to consider carefully before you start planting plants across the top of it but green roofs are a fantastic opportunity for um for wildlife and as i showed on my slides you've, we had the green bus stop roof and that's something which is um, potentially really good for all our pollinators the other thing you can think about is also um how your roof can be used to help reduce some of the climatic impacts so for example we talked a lot about carbon and our use of carbon so one thing you could also think about is is the potential for things like solar panels on roofs to help to generate energy and also you know um some of the roofs things like um, boxes for house martins things that sit underneath the roofs if you've got um potential to do something like that and also water capture and storage so obviously we're talking a lot about the fact during summer we have heavy droughts so if you can capture water store it and use that um in your gardens etc that's really helpful roofs are tricky because of of um especially in surrey <laughs> because we have a lot of very old houses and they're not always totally suitable for um some of the uh sort of more modern nature-based solution approaches but that doesn't mean that you can't do anything it would depend on your roof but um again happy to have a look at it and <laughs> feel free to um send me some pictures and i can take a look for you fabulous thank you lucy um right just a couple of other um questions coming in brilliant thank you very much for all these amazing questions um one from Christopher Fry, um, perhaps potentially over for you, Rob, um, that has Christopher Fry has said, just, just a thought, with hedgehog numbers plummeting in recent years in, in Surrey, um, is this a species that should be protected? Yeah, a, a fantastic question. Thank you, uh, Christopher, for the question. So in terms of protection, hedgehogs are a priority species, which means that a planning application or planning policy must consider their numbers before it's determined and ensure that there's not a detrimental impact to their numbers. However, they're not a protected species in, as in they would need to be surveyed for, for development per se as if a newt was or a dormouse was. To answer your question simply, yes, they should be a protected species, but there, and there is there was the potential for them to be qualifying under the wildlife and, and countryside act in, the, in a bigger way under recent petitions i think it was it chris grayling one of them was um was quite keen for them to be protected in a, in a bigger way but i think you're i think it's an interesting point i also think toad would benefit from more protection um so in terms of should they be protected yes um, because, only because um, they are having difficulty, as you, as you pointed out, and and further protection would help their numbers. Um, I would, it would appear. Okay, thank thank you, Rob, um, for that. So, so I suppose you could, we could talk about many mm. different species, couldn't we? Um, so yeah, no, for sure. Um, so th there's a, a question come in, or a query, I think, come in more so from um, Bob Challoner. Um, following discovery of two very rare moth species in 2020, um, their site was nominated for SNCI status. Um, mm. And Bob understands that the Surrey Local Sites Partnership, which considers these matters, hasn't met since 2019. Mm. um what's happening with that can anyone shed some light on that for bob please um i can if you'd like i'm sure yes. the others can as well but um, um no they're not dead at all they're still very alive alive and well i think uh, they i'm not sure the last time they did meet but they definitely do exist uh, do you have the email address of a relevant contact if, sorry do you yeah. me to, i can provide an email address to to to, to try and help if that would be useful yeah do you want would that be useful can you pop that in the in the chat yeah area um would that be all right rob and then people can take it from there well, to say that 
if I made the Surrey Wildlife Trust sort of EPAS or these teams don't have a say in in SNCI designations, that is the Surrey Local Sites Partnership. So we can't say yes or no, but they 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 do exist. And I'll pop the email address in the thing. Brilliant, fabulous. Thank you very much for that. Um, um, so Louis, one for you, please. Um, oh, hang on, my thing's just flipped around. <laughs> um, are bug life approaching farmers in the bug strips to change their ways to a more biodiverse farming? Can you answer that one for us? Um, yes, I'm, I'm happy to answer that. Sorry about my connection. It keeps throwing me out. It was fine in the practice. Um, and now we're experiencing some issues. So um, <laughs> yes, we began outreaching to farmers um, through the channels we have, um, which involves things like the farm clusters um, that some of you might be aware of and other environmental things. Um, and absolutely, that's a big part of the work. So we're trying to encourage farmers um, to do work with us. Sometimes we can provide that in an advisory role. Sometimes that might include funding for um, reseeding of wildflower meadows as well. So we do have a pot of that throughout the lifetime of the project. Um, so yes, it's a big part, um, but I'm part of the Space for Nature project, which has just started. So we're still in the process of building those relationships. Um, but my email's in the chat. So if if you are a farmer or you know a farmer that's interested, definitely pass that along or encourage them to map what they're doing already on our bee lines Excellent. about it and see how we can help them. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Louis. Hopefully that will um, shed some light on that as well. So back to Glenn, if, if one for you, a question for Glenn. Um, what are the biggest benefits and risks from re-wetting marshlands? If you'd like to, and yeah, perfect, thank you. Yeah, I think the, um, well, as Rob sort of mentioned earlier, I think the risks are, you know, understanding what is currently there already. Um, you, you know, uh, if you're re-wetting an area, are you gonna be, uh, is that gonna be the cost of, an, uh, of a, other species is it going to be at the cost of a protected species so it's really important to uh, understand that so again you know these bigger wetland schemes certainly you you would you i would suggest getting some ecologist input into those um other things might be if you're on a site where there's contamination in the soil as well and if that's going to eventually be running off into a water course um if you suspect there has been contamination in the past um it would be worth getting you know uh, soil testing done on those particular sites as well and of course the final thing is the um, local flood risk as well if you are re-wetting an area um, where are the outlets of that area and where is it running into is it going to flood uh, a local road you know is it going to cause localized flooding uh, in other areas as well and whether you're you know if you're on a floodplain or not you need to think about that because Certainly on a main river, um, you would want to be thinking about having early conversations with the environment agency um, about that. But in terms of benefits, you know, benefits of wetlands, you know, the stepping stone habitat of rewetting, you know, uh, these areas uh, for many, many different species, fantastic for biodiversity, great for carbon, great for natural flood management and nutrient retention. But another risk that might come with that if you have got an inflow into that wetland, are you collecting all the silt from somewhere else? And what is in that silt as well? So you could end up with a very costly management bill at some point down the line if you do have, if you're taking, you know, if the farmer, if there's a farmer upstream with an arable field, are you getting half his field into your wetland each year? So that's a real key one because they can silt up very quickly. And if there's, any heavy metals or anything not so nice in that, that's going to be very costly to dispose of. So that is certainly something to think of. Um, where your wetlands are maybe more fed by groundwater or you're, 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 you're digging them out a bit more, that's not so much of an issue. Okay, thank you, Glenn. Um, and we're just going to stick with you for a little while, <laughs> if that's all right. We'll keep the spotlight on you. Um, so there's a couple of other sort of questions that have come in with that. John Andrews is asking, is saying, given the potential impact of wetland works on land up and downstream, where should people start when, when planning works? Um, and any, do you have some good resources that you could recommend? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've sent out a list of uh, some good links um, that, Claire has, uh, that Claire has sent out. But in terms of planning wetland works, um, certainly near a main river, as I've just mentioned, um, you may need flood consent. Um, flood consent can be quite laborious um, if you're working in the floodplain. Um, but sometimes you can get around it. There's certain exemptions for putting things like scrapes in, etc., where you wouldn't have to go down a very onerous route. If you are putting larger wetlands in on a floodplain, you are going to need uh, an environmental permit to do so. Um, that comes from the Environment Agency. Um, I'd suggest getting help with that. It does take, averagely for bigger projects, it takes me about five days, five full days to actually work up those permits. So it is quite a lot of work mm. and we actually can sort that out now because it is so much work. So. If you're on an ordinary water course, it's a bit different. So um, ordinary water courses are actually uh, come under the jurisdiction of the Surrey County Council, who are the lead flood authority. This is a lot easier and uh, they're more concerned about what you're putting in channels. So if you're doing works in, in or around an ordinary water course, you can go to SCC um, and it's a lot less onerous and you can do an awful lot more. So. I would start by looking at the main river map and the main river map will show you whether you're on an ordinary water course from main river that's a really good place to start. And then in terms of actually um, design of wetlands etc really good resources with the um, wild fowl and wetland trust they're experts at this as well. Um, there are a number of consultancies that you could use as well. Uh, Wild Wildfire and Wetland Trust does have a consultancy arm as well, but it, it will cost money. But of course, we'd be, you know, if you have an idea of what you wanted to do, we, we would be the first port of call um, to offer you advice and sort of point you in the right direction, so to speak. Yeah, that's really useful to know, actually, Glenn, because we've had another question come in from Claire Bevan saying um, that they have a very wild area which runs along a stream, which needs some sort of management. And she's sort of asking how, you know, could they get an ecologist to come and advise um, on, on that project? So would they need to con contact you? Yeah, I'd suggest contacting me first um, with if you could send me a grid reference, um, if you could draw on the map uh, the length of the river um, and give me a, uh, send some photographs of what it currently looks like. I, I could sort of advise in the first instance, if you wanted it more detailed, there would be a cost associated with that from our ecology services team. Uh, but I could certainly um, advise on, yeah, you know, what may be the best management for that particular stretch and I'm happy to do that. That's wonderful. Thank you for that, Glenn. Um, so Louis, back over to you, um, please, for a question from Gillian. Um, part of an, her area comes in a beeline where they are surveying hedges. So this, well, it kind of for Louis and potentially I think actually um, for Lucy is that they, they'd like to get involved. How can they help? So um, either Louis or, or Lucy potentially could answer this one for us. Um, so I guess uh, we just look at enhancements of what existing there. If you can plant wildflower rich um, native seed mixes, that's what we really encourage. Um, trying to get a mosaic of habitats um, available throughout the year as well is really important. So looking at sympathetic management regimes um, for the area. And if you're doing work on those hedges in particular, we ask that uh, landowners can provide um, a cutting regime that's on a three year cycle so that there's always habitat available within those hedges. Um, and then I guess it's just a matter of making sure that a lot of habitats are available in a short space as many of them invertebrates. Uh, have very different requirements depending on their life stage, whether it's larval, whether it's egg, whether it's an adult. And so having a mix of those habitats in close proximity to the hedges as well is really important just so we can cater for all of those needs. Okay, wonderful. I don't know if, if Lucy wanted to add anything or you, I think that's, 
I think that's no, it's all, all good stuff. I think it's um, also with your your hedgerow. Think about the the life cycle of a hedgerow, which I will give the information to Claire about that, and um, just consider the management and how you can best enhance it. So um, we can give that as a bit of information post post webinar. Fabulous, thank you. Just Lucy. on that as well, we do offer as an organisation um, sort of fact sheets and management guidelines on our website. Um, for a range of different habitats and they're really brief so they're not some big wordy techie sciencey nonsense um, <laughs> they should be accessible but um, yeah wonderful yeah. thank you thank you very much panelists and sadly we, we've we've run out of time um if we, if with um <laughs> our questions our timing today um so I think um, we've had lots and lots of thank yous in the chat to our for our fabulous presenters. If your question hasn't been answered, then um, our team can look back at that and we can follow that up with you. But just want to say thank you so much for our speakers today. You've done a brilliant job. I know you had a very short um, time to be able to put your points across. So thank you very much for that. And thank you for all of you who've joined us and stayed with us for the afternoon. Um, really hope that you've been able to take something away from one of those um, presentations and um, we have got our next webinar just to make sure I'm getting the dates correct on Thursday the 1st of December at 5 30 and this webinar is going to be all about choosing environmental um, interventions in your local area and we're going to be joined with from um, speakers from Plant Life, Pesticide Action Network UK, Surrey Association of Local Councils and of course some, some of our team from Surrey Wildlife Trust um, and I believe that the link has already gone in um, the chat box there for to be able to sign up for for the next webinar so um, with that I'd just like to say thank you again for joining us and um, for all your wonderful comments and questions and we will hopefully see you at the next webinar so thank you very much everybody enjoy your evening <laughs>